Uh, would you pray with me? Then we're going to reflect on the scriptures together and uh, consider what Christ has to say to us today. So, Lord Jesus, you are the word of God, the eternal word. You have taken our humanity into yourself that we might be united with the Father in you by the Holy Spirit. Thank you. Jesus, we are not worthy of that grace. We are not worthy of that gift. But you have given it freely, and because of your power, we have confidence that you are able to do the thing that we have just confessed that you have done. You are able to make us complete and new in you. So, Lord, I submit myself to you. I ask, Lord, that you would fill me afresh. I pray that your spirit would uh, would fill me and speak through me. Would you take all that is not of you and push it to the side, bury it, burn it up, consume it? And Lord Jesus, would you, would, would you just do your thing here tonight? God, we command in the authority of your name, Lord Jesus, that every spirit, every voice that is not of you, we command it in the authority of Jesus' name to be silent. And Lord Jesus, we ask that you would open up our ears, our eyes, our hearts, to hear you, see you, feel you, experience you, and to respond to you with faith. We pray this in your powerful name. Amen. Well, this evening is uh, our time to celebrate transfig the Day of Transfiguration. There's a beautiful um, cultural uh, worship, expression of worship, that people in Cameroon engaged in uh, back in the 1970s, where people from Cameroon got together and they um, they acted out the stories of the gospel, and they did it in tableau. So I don't know if any of you were, were in drama class where you had to learn what tableau is, but you, um, you pose yourself in a particular way, and you hold it. And so people, you do it together, and what it does is that, that embodiment tells a story. And in Cameroon, back in the 1970s, they did this with the... With the the stories of the gospel, and then they took pictures of these tableaus of Christ, and then they, then an artist painted them, and they're called Jesus Mafa, and they they are widely available online, and these these beautiful beautiful paintings of Christ in an African expression, if you will, and uh, and that's a real gift to us. And I was thinking as we're here on Transfiguration Day that we need more of that that actually we need more people creating art that embodies the reality of the gospel and proclaims the glory and the goodness of Christ in our flesh, in our context. Because the transfiguration is this time when the glory of God shines through the body of Jesus Christ, the Middle Eastern Jewish man. There's the picture that we're looking for. Um, Middle Eastern Jewish man whose body is transfigured so that his body became like light. And you can see here on the mountain, you've got Jesus robed in white. Beside him on either side, in purple is Moses, in yellow is Elijah. And um, Jesus' disciples are there at the mountain, Peter, James, and John, and they are watching him. And they are um, overwhelmed. They don't know what they're experiencing. They did not come to the mountaintop expecting Jesus to become radiant, filled with light. And so they were overwhelmed, and they were not expecting to see Moses and Elijah. Peter, in his, uh, his ignorance, his, his, his eagerness to do something, said, Hey, Jesus, let's make, let's make booths, one for you, one for Elijah, one for Moses. And the Bible says he did not know what he was talking about. Because when these disciples were confronted with Jesus, transfigured before them, it blew their categories. They did not have any understanding of what was happening right there. And Jesus warned them, actually, don't tell anybody about what you've seen until after the Son of Man has been raised from the dead. Because what also happened on that mountaintop is that as Jesus was there with Elijah and with Moses, and as his, as his disciples were totally overwhelmed, at that moment, a cloud came to the mountain. And that cloud was the very presence of God the Father coming to the mountaintop. 
And the Father speaks out of the cloud and says, This is my Son. Listen to him. And in that moment, the disciples bowed their heads. They, they had to hide from the presence of God. And when they looked up, they saw nobody else there except Jesus. They looked up and saw Jesus only. And they did not understand what they had experienced. They did not understand until after Jesus had died and risen from the dead. And after Jesus opened to them the understanding of Moses and Elijah that they had not had before. The transfiguration was something that they experienced, they saw it, it transformed the body of Christ in front of them, and they could not understand it until later on when Jesus explained to them all of Moses and the prophets and how they were speaking of him. And there's so many things happening in the transfiguration that for us are remarkable good news because Jesus, we confess, has taken our humanity on himself. And so he is our future. He is our destiny. We are called to union with God in Jesus Christ. And we are being transformed into the image of Christ, which we're going to talk about some more. But one of the things that's incredible is that this miracle of people experiencing the, the glory of God in their bodies is something that has happened since. Jesus does this over and over in history as he dwells in his people. And as Jesus uh, lives in us, he reveals his glory, his beauty, his light in our bodies. And it's a mystery, but it's real, and we're invited into it. And tonight, we're going to focus particularly on 2 Corinthians chapter 4, where the Apostle Paul talks about what it's like to have the light of God given to us. So let's read from 2 Corinthians chapter 4, verses 3 to 6. And even if our gospel is veiled, it is veiled to those who are perishing. The God of this age has blinded the minds of unbelievers so that they cannot see the light of the gospel that displays the glory of Christ, who is the image of God. For what we preach is not ourselves, but Jesus Christ as Lord, and ourselves as your servants for Jesus' sake. For God, who said, let light shine out of darkness, made his light shine in our hearts to give us the light of the knowledge of God's glory displayed in the face of Christ. So this passage, when we read it, has a lot of strong, vivid language that often we react to. When it talks about the gospel being veiled so that some people, those who are perishing, don't understand it, I think we would react to that and say, how? How is that possible? How is that fair that some people don't get to experience this? That some people can't understand it? How is it that the light of God does not shine on all people? How is that possible? It doesn't seem good. And I think it can provoke within us, particularly because the Apostle Paul uses the language of we and them, us and them. Um, he talks about people who are unbelievers. And he says, but we have received the light, but they cannot see the light of the gospel that displays the glory of Christ. We can get uh, angst in our hearts about that kind of language, particularly in our time where we are very, very attuned to the pain of being excluded. But the Apostle Paul says, as we're going to see on the next slide, that even if our gospel is veiled, it is veiled to those who are perishing. The God of this age has blinded the minds of unbelievers so that they cannot see the light of the gospel that displays the glory of Christ, who is the image of God. Keep going. Next slide. For what we preach is not ourselves, but Jesus Christ as Lord, and ourselves as your servants for Jesus' sake. This passage is essential. This part is essential. Because when we read about some people being excluded, and some people saying, we have, we have actually been included, we have a major ethical problem in a, from a Canadian perspective. And so when Paul says what we preach is not ourselves, but Jesus Christ as Lord and ourselves as your servants for Jesus' sake, 
that had better be true. Because if that's not true, then what it means is that people who belong to Christ are, consider themselves better than others. When they proclaim the gospel, they are setting themselves up for privilege and honor and power, and they don't have to serve anybody else. But that is the complete opposite of what the gospel itself is and of what Paul is saying here. Paul is saying, we do not proclaim ourselves. We are not here to push ourselves on you, to make you think that we're amazing. We are here to proclaim the Lord Jesus. Jesus Christ is Lord and King. He is over all. And us, we are simply called to be your servants for his sake. We are called to be your slaves for his sake. And so the way in which the Apostle Paul relates to the church in Corinth and the other believers is actually not with the kind of power differential that says, we're inside, you're outside, we're better than you. It's not that at all. So we have been included by this light and the love of God. Therefore, we lay down our lives as servants of you for the sake of Christ. So we're going to talk about what that means a little bit more deeply right now. Next slide. So the main content of the proclamation of the, of the early church is Jesus Christ is Lord. Jesus is King. He is God taking on human flesh, fully God, fully human. He is the one in whom we were created. Next slide, please. So Jesus Christ is Lord. He is the image of God. He is the glory of God. That is essential for us to understand. Next slide, please. Because if Jesus is truly the image of God, and he truly is the glory of God, then for us to be servants and slaves of others for the sake of Jesus is for us to be in the place of greatest glory when we lay down our lives, when we take on the burdens of others, when we under, like, go the extra mile to understand their perspective, when we enfold them in our arms, when we spend time grieving with them, when we suffer with them, when we become their servants for the sake of Jesus, that is when we actually embody the glory of God, when we are actually living out what it means to be made in the image of Christ. Next slide, please. Because you and I are made in the image of God, but Jesus is the image of God. You and I are made in the image of God. Jesus is the image of God. What that means is that if you just turn the language around, right? Well, if Jesus is the image of God and we are made in the image of God, then you and I are truly created in Jesus Christ. All humans who bear the image of God are truly created in Jesus Christ. And this is what the scriptures everywhere teach, right? Through him, through the word, through Jesus Christ, all things were made. Without him, nothing was made that has been made. God created all things through our Lord Jesus Christ, who lived and died and rose again. We are truly created in Jesus Christ. He is the image of God. What that also means is that you and I become most authentically what we are created to be when we behold Jesus. Because uh, people, will, people will use this image. I'm actually in the portable, and if you could see, if you've been in these portables, you know that there are uh, mirrors right in front of me. Uh, mirrors reflecting back to me my image. And as image bearers of God, we will reflect the character, the life of whatever we worship. Human beings do not have existence, character in and of ourselves. We don't create our own meaning and our, create our own identity not authentically, we will reflect whatever it is that we say is of highest value. We are reflections of what we worship. And so this is exceptionally important in our lives because when we, uh, when we worship things that are not the living God, that are not Jesus Christ who died and rose again, we are by definition worshiping things that are less than what we were created to become. Let me say that again. When we worship things 
other than the Lord Jesus Christ. We are, by definition, worshiping things that are less than what we are created to become, which means that we will end up twisted and broken if we cannot behold the image of God revealed in Jesus Christ our Lord. Because humans were created in Christ Jesus for communion with God. Next slide. And so this is what it actually means to perish and to be destroyed. If we are unable to see Jesus Christ in whose image we are created, then we are being twisted and warped and broken and mangled every day because we cannot behold the one in whose image we were made. And it's really important to understand that God is not the one who has blinded the eyes of humanity. And you'll remember the story back in the beginning, in Genesis chapter 1, when humanity was, or Genesis chapter 2, when humanity was young, and the serpent came to humans. And in this conversation with the human beings, the serpent said, did God really say that you can't eat of any of these trees in this beautiful garden? And actually, you know what? He was lying. When he said that if you eat of some of these trees and you would die, he was lying because God is afraid of you. And the serpent began to spin this idea of God. The, The serpent began to paint a different image of God before the eyes of our human ancestors. And we believed the image of God that the serpent painted for us there, and it was a lie. And when we believe that lie that the serpent spoke about God, we acted on it. We acted as though God were not good, as though God could somehow be threatened by us, as though God would somehow not be true to himself and not follow through on what he had said he would do. And we sinned. We rebelled against God. And our oppression, our evil, our suspicion, our greed, our, our sexual license, All of that began there when our image of God was clouded. We could no longer see the living God for whom we were made because the serpent had deceived us by painting a different image for us. Next slide. And so when Paul talks in this passage, Paul does not say that Christians have Uh, a different starting point than anybody else. If you notice these words in red, he says, if our gospel is veiled, it is veiled to those who are perishing. The God of this age has blinded the minds of the unbelievers so they cannot see the light of the gospel. But then he says in verse 6, God who said, let light shine out of darkness, God made his light shine in our hearts to give us the light of the knowledge of God's glory, which implies that all of our hearts were dark, as creation was dark in the very beginning, when the Spirit of God was hovering over the deep, and all was formless and void. In that place, God spoke, let let light come out of darkness. That's the condition of our hearts, when when the enemy of God has blinded our eyes and we cannot behold the glory of God in the face of Christ. Paul is saying that his heart was dark. His heart was a place of chaos. His heart was a place where true understanding did not dwell until God spoke and shone the light of Christ within. So let's talk about some of the strategies that the enemy uses even today to continue to veil our eyes. Because there's some specific things that Paul wants us to be aware of in 2 Corinthians. First is, Satan blinds people by dividing the scriptures Right before this, in 2 Corinthians chapter 3, Paul has talked about how when people read the Bible, read, read the, the scriptures, which, by which he means Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, Deuteronomy, Joshua, Judges, right? This is before the New Testament canon had been formed. When people read that text as though it's not relating to Jesus Christ and not proclaiming Jesus Christ crucified, our hearts, our minds are blinded. And in fact, this was the condition of all of people 
before Christ came and died and rose from the dead. As I mentioned, with those disciples in the tra- like at the Mount of Transfiguration, they saw the glory of God in Jesus Christ radiating bright light, and they could not understand it until after Jesus had died and risen from the dead. And only the living Christ, only Jesus Christ himself, was able to open up their understanding to show them that all of the scriptures from Genesis to Malachi, all of those, what we call the Old Testament, are the very words of Jesus Christ himself. So whenever the enemy comes in and says, oh, no, 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 you can understand the Bible without having to think about it in the light of Jesus Christ crucified, there's a blinding that's happening there. And the Bible is an incredibly beautiful and complex book. There's so much that it speaks over and over again. But the revelation of God happens in the person of Jesus Christ. And so for the Bible to be the word of God, it must serve the living word of God who is Jesus. And Jesus himself, the word of God, has spoken all of those words of the Old Testament so that we might know God, so that they might point to him. And so we need to learn to read the scriptures with Jesus Christ crucified in the center. The other thing that uh, blinds us to the glory of God in the face of Christ is a church, a community that claims to be God's people that contradicts the reality of Jesus Christ crucified with our lives. Over the last uh, five years, although, I mean, this is a perpetual story in the history of the church, uh, powerful men in particular exercise incredible abuse. And there are leaders that have come up out of London here in, in London, Ontario, who have been trained in the scriptures here in Canada, who have uh, started big ministries, and who have been abusers of power. And they have stood in their pulpits and tried to, to say that they are proclaiming the word of God. Well, what's happening around them is uh, people are living in fear of these pastors because these pastors have tempers that are way out over the top because nobody around these pastors will hold them accountable. And that leads to financial mismanagement. It leads to the breaking of fellowship. And when other people look at that, particularly people in the church or outside of it, they say, this is a person who's interpreting the word of God, who's teaching the word of God. This is terrible. We can't trust these Christians. And our conduct as the church, when we do not embody the reality of Jesus Christ crucified, contributes to this blinding. It makes it hard for us to believe that the glory of God is truly there in Jesus Christ. The other thing that I think is very prevalent for us in our time is that the promise of good things without Jesus Christ crucified blinds us to the glory of God in Jesus Christ crucified. Let let me say a bit more about that. So many of us desire health. So many of us desire to have strong bodies. So many of us desire strength in our, uh, not in, in our limbs and in our work. We want to be successful. And God has created us for work. God has created our bodies for wholeness. Of course, those are good gifts from God. But for many of us, particularly in our time, we, we will take spiritual practices, we will take prayer, And we will make the goal of that prayer, we will make the goal of those spiritual practices, the health of our bodies, the wealth of our families. And so in that sense, the the cross of Jesus Christ is not something that we are called to enter into and to suffer. We're not called to suffer with him. We are called to just live in the victory that he has purchased for us on that cross so that we don't have to suffer anymore. And so our fasting can become... Uh, basically to trim ourselves up, to help our bodies feel good so that we are sharp. We can take fasting, which is intended to actually help us grow in union with Jesus Christ, and we turn it back as something that just builds us up. And we'll pray because we have visions that we want to see become reality. And those visions do not depend on Jesus Christ crucified. Those visions actually are about us becoming more powerful, more self-centered. And the thing is that the enemy offered the very same thing to Jesus. He said, I will give you all of the kingdoms of the world if you will just bow down and worship me. And Jesus said no. Jesus committed himself to walking to the cross and suffering and then entering into the promise of his inheritance as king of kings and lord of lords out of love and faithfulness to God the Father. And when we turn the 
turn the gospel or the message of Jesus or the scriptures, when we turn those into just keys for success here in this life, we are blinded to the glory of God in the face of Jesus Christ because the scriptures are vividly clear that Jesus is glorified when he is on the cross, not only when he rose from the dead. And like I said earlier, when our eyes are blinded to the glory of God in the face of Jesus Christ crucified, then we are twisted, right? We become twisted. And you know that this is true. You've seen, as I mentioned, people coming out of London, building churches, where people think that they're, what they're hearing is biblical teaching, but what's happening in the church is completely the opposite of G what Jesus Christ does in our lives. And it's crushing. It's crushing. So what are we to do about that? When we, when we are blinded by Satan, where's the hope? Well, let's go what, see what's next. As I said, this is what it means to perish and to be destroyed when we cannot see Jesus Christ in whose image we were created. Next. What it means to be saved is to see the glory of God in the face of Jesus Christ crucified, the image of God. For God created us in his image. So when we behold Christ, then we have the opportunity, the hope, the reality of becoming what we were created to be in the beginning. Next. And Paul is so clear that that gift comes only from God. For God who said, let light shine out of darkness, made his light shine in our hearts to give us the light of the knowledge of God's glory displayed in the face of Christ. Friends, our hope of salvation relies only in the grace of our creator who alone can rescue us from darkness. Our minds are shrouded by the deception of the enemy unless God shines his light and speaks again a new creation into being in us. And that is exactly what God has done in Jesus Christ by the power of the Holy Spirit. He has come to you and me, power hungry, selfish though we are, deceived though we are. And he says to us, come alive. Open your eyes. Come to the light. Become light in Jesus Christ. Next. So what does it mean to behold God's light? Well, first of all, we got to be immersed in the scriptures. Uh, for those of you who were there on Thursday night, you know that Winston ex in, um, exhorted us to be students of the scriptures. We have to be students of the scriptures because the scriptures reveal Christ to us. From Genesis to Malachi, they proclaim the good news of God in Jesus Christ. And the New Testament guides us in the interpretation. It fulfills the story, if you will. But also, friends, when we come to the table, and when we, uh, when we come to the bread and the cup, we are coming to this embodiment, the Lord's Supper, this, this, this um, playing again, if you will, of this incredible feast that Jesus invites us to join, where he is the one that we feast on. And so the Lord's Supper is an incredible gift to us because you know, no matter, like the greatest orators on earth cannot speak the full glory of Jesus. Our words have been going on for generation after generation after generation, and there's always more to be said because Jesus surpasses our greatest understanding infinitely. And this bread and this juice or this wine is his gift to us. And he says, take and eat it. This is my body. This is my blood. And as the glory of God shone forth from Jesus' physical body on the mountaintop, when we come to these things, the bread and the cup, we should come looking for the glory of God in the face of Jesus Christ crucified. We don't take it lightly. We say, God, show me your glory here in the bread and in the cup. Because Jesus said, this is my body. This is my blood. And so these very common things become venues for us to experience the gospel, or to experience the glory and the beauty of God tangibly, with our hands, with our tongues, with our swallowing, with our digestive system, with our bodies. Our bodies take in Christ. It's amazing. And of course, we get to behold the beauty of Jesus Christ, the word of God in whom all things and by whom all things were created in the creation itself. It's so good to go for walks. It's so good to hear the sound of the water breaking on the beach. It's so good to hear the, 
the coursing of the river, the ripples as it goes over the rocks. It's so good to hear the, the, the silence, to hear the silence of the snow falling around us. It's good to feel the, the bracing cold on your face. Creation declares the goodness of God. And we get to behold the goodness and the glory of Jesus Christ when we go into creation. Hallelujah. So I want to invite us next. I want to invite us to be a church because this is the other key thing. We are called to be the church that then radiates the God, God's light. If God's light has been spoken into our bodies, into our fellowship, then we are called to be the church that lays bare the beauty of the gospel for all to see. And this is what Paul spent his life doing, just making the gospel as clear as he could to people after he had received the light. And that necessarily means that we are called to be a church that serves others for the sake of Jesus Christ crucified. We are called to become the slaves of our neighbors for the sake of Jesus Christ crucified. And friends, we live in a time where we are all tempted and pulled towards uh, virtual influence, big crowds, big followers, to make it look good so that people will think they're cool. That is not the gospel. It is not the gospel. The gospel is flawed people whose skin has marks all over it, people whose breath smells, who go to their neighbor and do the hard work of getting to know that neighbor, sharing a meal with them, rejoicing with them, having conversations with them. The gospel comes in people learning how to make small talk with other people so that they can just build a bond of trust. The gospel comes in a practical helping hand, making sure that a neighbor's driveway is shoveled, making sure that people are fed and housed. If we are not living that way, but we are want to proclaim that Jesus Christ died and rose again and that that is good news, it just shows that our hearts are still dark because we cannot proclaim Christ crucified as good news when we refuse to die with him. Now, our inner world is called to be filled with God's light. And this one is tricky. It's tricky for me because there are moments in my life where I know that I've beheld the beauty of Jesus Christ, where I know that my heart has been filled with the, with the light of God and where there's been joy and peace. But to be honest, for me, a lot of my spiritual journey is up and down. It's hard. It's very hard. And I'm always, I always feel like there's something more for me. There's something, there's a deeper way I need to grow. Because Jesus really is calling me, calling you, calling us into this spiritual communion with him. And I'm so encouraged by the stories of old saints, like Saint Anthony, who went out into the desert and fought with the devil <laughs> in the desert for like 18 or 20 years by himself, fasting, praying, going through all sorts of struggles. I'm grateful for him because in my time, people kind of expect that if you come to Jesus, everything's quickly fixed inside. There's no real battle. If you're, if you're battling inside, then somehow your faith's not good enough, or maybe you didn't really get saved, or maybe you're not praising hard enough or something like that. But the old saints went out and they did battle in the wilderness for decades, and they suffered. And in that place of battling, spiritual battling on their own, fasting, praying all night, on and on, their lives, their spiritual lives were purified. And people went out to them to say, we need your help. We need you to point us to God. And the beautiful thing is that St. Anthony, after he had been out in the wilderness fasting and praying for 18, 20 years, they say, they say that his body was like that of a young man because his spiritual life had transformed his body. And now it's easy for us in 20th, 21st century Canada to look back and say, ah, it's just, it's a legend. That's, nah, that, that can't be true. <laughs> but actually, if Jesus Christ on a mountaintop radiated light that overwhelmed his disciples because the very life of, he is the very life of God. 
then it makes sense that our life in him, if we are alive in him, if he lives in us, his light is in us, it should transform our bodies. So I don't think that it's just fiction that Anthony's body was strong after 18 years of fasting and war warfare. I think that all things exist because the one who is invisible called them to be. And so if we know that one who is the creator, then our bodies will be transformed as our spirits are transformed in Jesus Christ. And so our inner world is pulled to communion with God in Jesus Christ for the sake of our life, our physical life, our real relationships here and now. And it's a battle. It's a long battle. It's a hard battle. But the victory has been accomplished by Christ on the cross. And we're called to walk with him. And then our bodies are transformed by the spiritual power of God in this life, yes, but in the life to come as well. We pass from this life with its passing glory into the realm where the glory does not fade. We go from glory to glory, from strength to strength until we appear before God in Zion. Hallelujah. Praise be to God. So friends, I want to call us as a church to behold the beauty of God, the glory of God in the face of Jesus Christ. He is worthy. He is worthy. He is worthy. And in fact, not only is he worthy, as though he uh, accomplished a great victory, and we just remember him, he is alive forever. He is the image of God in whom you were created in the image of God. So when you behold Jesus Christ in the bread, in the scriptures, in the communion of saints, in the real people around you with all of our diversity, as you behold the beauty of God, the glory of God in the face of Christ there, you are being transformed into ever-increasing glory yourself. And that delights your heavenly Father.